Hi, my name is Doug. This is another Emerald Hill Skylet. In this Skylet, we'll share our workflow for using CCD Inspector and a spreadsheet to be able to conquer image tilt and field curvature. So let's get started. First of all, what we did uh, is we recognized that CCD Inspector was not going to be a perfect solution to show us and indicate exactness in field curvature and in tilt. Instead, CCD Inspector should be viewed as a guideline. So with that in mind, we realized that once we saw the numbers for tilt and field curvature drop, then we should go look visually and inspect the images. And if indeed we were happy with the corners, uh, the star shapes and the corners, then uh, at that point, we knew that we could begin enjoying uh, the amateur astronomy hobby again. So we didn't look at uh, CCD Inspector as our master, rather it was just a guide. So the first thing we did is we found a patch in the sky um, in which the stars were fairly even. And the best patch I could find was this uh, H, uh, see, what was the exact star name? HD192911. I know that's random, but I'll show you why we liked it. First of all, it was very rich in its field. Uh, that is, it had a lot of stars. And this is the field of view for my Rasa telescope that you see here in the lower left. Um, secondly, there were stars all the way out to the corners in the entire field of view. Third, we wanted to find a field that was fairly balanced. You'll notice there's no like big nebula or globular cluster or planetary nebula or something that sort of would throw off the, the, uh, the vision of CCD inspector to see it as an even field of view. Now I know there were uh, folks that told us, well, CCD inspector is designed so that it wouldn't uh, let something skew it if you had a, a brighter star on one side or the other. But to us, when we use CCD inspector, it did seem to be sometimes uh, vulnerable for uh, the smallest whims that we didn't understand. So to get rid of the variables as much as possible, we looked for an even star field like this. There had to be quite a few stars in the star field, like hundreds. And we also wanted to be someplace that was fairly high in the sky. And at this time of year when we were doing our study, uh, this field of view resulted in that. We just picked this star in the middle of this field and we used it as a guide star for us. But you could pick any rich star field that you wanted to uh, that met these conditions. Again, you're trying to make sure that it's pretty evenly lit with stars, not a bright star in this corner and then darkness in this corner, okay? So we, um, right now, for example, we would slew to that spot and we would then go to SharpCap, which was the imaging program that we used, and we would use the settings in SharpCap to be able to explain where to save those files. And we instructed SharpCap to save them all in the same place. So that way we could, we could shoot five snapshots at a time for each uh, setting that we did on our uh, adjustment device. Okay, more about that in a second. So it's important to shoot more than one in case uh, your particular first shot has um, extra noise in this part of the picture. By shooting five pictures, you reduce the chance that you'll skew the results. What's more, it's probably good to change the settings between the five shots. And for us, we always change the settings to the same pattern of exposure and gain. So for example, on the first shot, we might shoot an exposure that was 30 seconds at zero gain. On the second shot, we might shoot an exposure that was 20 seconds at 100 gain. 
then we might shoot 20 seconds at 200 gain, and then uh, 10 seconds at 300 gain, and then five seconds at 300 gain. It doesn't matter what set of star exposures and gain you pick. Our recommendation is that you pick five, um, five exposures that work for the star field you pick so that you don't get any error codes when you show them to CCD Inspector. And CCD Inspector can and will give you error codes. If, for example, it can't find enough stars, or if there's not a good enough distribution for stars, it would give us error codes if we were in the wrong part of the sky. Sometimes I think those error codes came about because the exposures didn't show off that part of the sky. So find five exposures that work for you and give CCD Inspector plenty of options to work with with those five exposures. Now you're probably wondering, how do you keep track of all this data? What we recommend is that you use an Excel spreadsheet like this one. At the top in the column headers, we put position. You could use whatever name makes sense for you. Then action, again, You'll see what I mean by these, but pick whatever name works for you. Then we used, uh, we wanted to know if we were turning the long, the long screw or the short screw. You might on your device, you might know the screws by, by calling them, say for instance, push and pull. Uh, then we asked, uh, we had a header for which screws we had adjusted. And most of the time, we were adjusting all three at once. Uh, then we had a column for the report of the curvature, the report of the tilt. And then CCD Inspector also tells you the direction of the tilt. And then we always kept track of what our focuser motor, our focus motor was set to what stop it was in for that particular adjustment. And what this means is you have to readjust your focus for every single adjustment you make. That's just part of this. And then we also confirmed how many images did we take. Uh, you can make this into a chart if you want to see your, your progress. I didn't find the, the graph very helpful. In fact, I found it sort of frustrating. Why, for our Celestron Rasa, did we seem to get so many widely varying reports at so many different focuser positions, so many different um, adjustment levels? Why was this happening? I think my own theory is part of that is because CCD is a guide. I have a little theory that perhaps with my Celestron Rasa, there would be more than one spot where field curvature percentage would drop and tilt report would drop. I think there's more than one spot where that would work on a Rasa. And I can't explain why, because everybody you talk to says with an F2, a focal ratio F2 scope, that the critical focus zone and thereby you could reason, the corollary, that the mirror placement and the mirror um, dimensioning, that it would be very exact. But I found that I could sometimes find two or three different places, maybe like, you know how in sound they talk about harmonics of a tuning fork or whatever, or harmonics on a guitar. I found that I think in several different um, generations of, of adjustments, I could find multiple spots where the percentage of field curvature and tilt would drop. You've got to find it for your scope, whatever kind of scope you have. If it's a Rasa, I'd appreciate knowing whether you found the same on yours. In other words, was this graph a linear graph? Did it, did it start with a high curvature and a high tilt? and then you reached a point that it bottomed out, and then when you passed that point, it kept getting bigger. Now that's what I would find. I, that's what I thought I would find, is a sort of like an autofocus graph in Nina, you know? 
I thought it would be a bell-shaped curve with uh, trends and uh, uh, hy hyperbola or whatever, hyperbolic curve, uh, bottoming out. And at that low point, that's where I thought the device would want to be. But instead, in my findings, you'll have to see if your mileage varies. I didn't. My, my graph was all over the place. Um, so you got to make a spreadsheet that works for you. By position, I meant when I locked down my uh, camera holding device, which I put in the description for this video, the website where I received a beta, a beta test unit for testing the position of the camera relative to the scope. So you could spin out the camera farther with this Octopi Astro device. And I loved it because at least it, it gave me, it gave me a, a tool that I felt like I had some uh, degree of impact on the scope's uh, field curvature and tilt. Although it wasn't predictable always, I could, I could have an impact. And without that, I felt like the Rasa and the particular camera I had, the ZWO ASI 2600 MC Pro, I felt like that the adjustments were not usable. Uh, and I did a video about that you'll find on the same YouTube channel, Emerald Hill Skies. I talked for an hour about how I felt like that the camera and the scope didn't really give you the tools you needed to set uh, correct for field curvature and correct tilt. So I love this little device. Uh, when I would screw those screws and, and force that camera farther out, I would mark uh, what position. In my mind, I just, I gave it a position, like if it started all the way racked in and I, I went to each of the three screws and went a half turn out, then I called that position 1.5. And then if I did another half turn out, that was position two. And another half turn out, that was position 2.5, and so on. You've got to come up with a name that works for you so you know where the positions are. It's just that if you do bottom out and then you go past it, you want to be able to go back to that position with that name again. In the action column, I just uh, explained whether I was making the camera go out away from the mirror or closer to the mirror. In the long and the short, I explained what screw I was using. In my device, the, the beta testing device I had, I pretended that the, the shorter screw was the one that was pushing the camera away from the mirror. But your uh, screws might use different names. Uh, you could describe the longer screw as a pull screw that pulled it closer. You've got to decide what to call each screw. Just be consistent. It doesn't matter what you call them. Just be consistent. But as you observe your device, figure out what that screw does. If it makes it move away, then you could call it, you know, pushing out from the mirror, if that's what you want to call it, or pulling out from the mirror. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. Then I would mark which three, I would mark which screw I moved. And then I would, I would do the test. Now let's get to the test. In CCD Inspector, you'll notice that you open up Inspector, CCD Inspector to this screen. Um, you simply open up your folder where SharpCap or whatever imaging program you used stashed your five images. So for instance, if I wanted to grab the five images that I shot um, on, let's say, August 2nd, and see I shot five here between 135 and 137. It took me about two minutes to run through my pattern of five shots, you see. So if I want to uh, bring those into CCD Inspector, I now I click open, and that's what I just did. I, you see I have these five ready to go here. Now I mark those five with, in this case, there are six. I select those six and I click on the button that's labeled curvature. When I click on that button, it opens up this window. 
Now this window is CC Inspector's attempt to give you a graphical picture of what your field curvature and tilt look like. And this crosshair in the middle is at the geographic center of where it should be. But depending on your um, particular situation, you could have, instead of being an even blue circle, it could be shifted over to the right. And your green and your orange could be farther over toward the crosshair. I'm getting closer and closer in this picture to being uh, centered with the field curvature and the tilt. So I, I'm making progress, you see. Up here in the upper left, you'll have a couple of important numbers. Curvature is the percentage of curvature you've got so far. And that's how much of a bowl shape it would take for your image sensor to perceive that the stars were all in focus. And you want that to be flat. But in my case, my sensor would have to have a 27% curvature in order to perceive that the stars are all evenly uh, lit. Um, you want that field curvature to be as low as you can get it. Long timers who have been doing this hobby forever tell me, don't sweat it if you get it down to 20. 20 is fine. That's what they tell me. Uh, I started noticing at the mid-20s, I could put up with the corners. Until then, they look like the stars look like seashells or little tadpoles with little tails. They had chevron shapes or looked like little flags, little pennants, or just round blobs. They were misshaped in those corners. But around the mid-20s, when I look at those corners, I think, yeah, that's good enough for now. <laughs> it's not perfect, but it's good enough. Um, then the second number you want is total tilt. And that's the degree to which the whole image is skewed to one side or another. Now you want this tilt to be no higher than the teens, but it's better to get it in the single digits. That's better. You can see in this particular segment of six shots, it happens to be 16%. And then this is the direction, minus 143 degrees is the direction of angular tilt. It even shows you an arrow. See how it's kind of reddish down here? It's like an emergency. It's like an ambulance light saying, this is still not good. Um, so in the spreadsheet then, notice that you can record that, um, those numbers, the curvature percentage. So in this line right here, you'll see that I've got 26.9 for the curvature percentage. And that's taken from this field's curvature there. And then I've got uh, 16 for the tilt. And again, that's taken from the readout of the tilt there. And then notice I've got uh, one, negative 143 for the direction of the tilt. And that's taken from that, um, the degrees of the tilt origin there, kind of like the direction of the wind coming at a wind vane. Um, here, after I got the stars in focus using sharp cap again, I just put the number of my focus, uh, my focus motor. And of course, you can see that in sharp cap uh, here in the focus controller. Now your focus controller will look different than mine, perhaps if you have a different brand, but this is the down here in this, can you see in the lower right where my mouse is? Um, this is the way the app works for Celestron, uh, USB focus motors, but depending on what motor you have, you might see different numbers, but here you can see this position number, I would simply write that in the spreadsheet. Now, I think it's important to keep these notes because you'll reach a point in which you find something that, that you like. You find a setting that you like. Look up here in this row where I got the field curvature down to 23.9. Well, I want to get back to that someday. And look here where I got the 
tilt as low as eight. I wanna get back to eight someday. So this is a great line for me to get back to. 23.9 field curvature and eight degrees of tilt. If I could get back to that line and find that again, then it would be super. Um, how do you measure and keep consistent on your, um, on your turns? The best approach I could find was to use one of these uh, calipers. And I left it out. You see the picture of the telescope there. I left my calipers in the box out by the scope. So I don't have it to show you in this video. But you can get on Amazon or on, on the web and search for Vern, Vernier calipers. You can spend any amount of money you want. The cheapest, the cheapest uh, non-brand name when imported from China you know, might cost $13. I saved up and bought a, a Japanese pair uh, that received really good reviews, and mine were like $100, $110, I'm ashamed to say. But whatever you buy, you're using the, those vernier uh, calipers to, to measure the height of the screws. And I have another video when I'm actually out there at the scope adjusting and measuring, and you can watch that video on my website to see how that that is done. So as you're using um, CCD Inspector, what you'll want to do then is every time you get a new set of five images, you'll want to load those in. And these five images, you'll want to you'll want to remove. And is this the button used? Or, yeah, use the remove button to remove them, oddly enough. So my next set, I could say open, and I, I might choose, you know, these that I shot at about 2 a.m. I'll bring those in, I'll highlight them in this screen, then I'll click curvature. And when I click curvature button, the new screen is going to come up like this, and it's going to show you the new reading. And then you can put that in your spreadsheet, refocus your scope, using your focus motor and sharp cap or whatever imaging program you're using, and then plot the focus motor um, uh, setting here. So once you reach a theoretical curve bottom and you want to go back to it, now that's hard because you'll look at your records and you'll wonder, how do I get back to that point? And that's where your vernier caliper measurement really helps the height of the screw. After I got the vernier calipers, it took me one hour to reach a level that was good enough for me to use for right now for observing. I had used up four nights, six hours all each, four, each of those four nights. In other words, over 20 hours without those calipers. So they're crucial to be able to get back to places and be able to make sure that otherwise you don't know whether you're turning them consistently. Every single tilt is different. Whereas if you got those exacting, exacting, measuring to the hundredths of a millimeter, once you get to the point that you can measure to hundredths of a millimeter, that digital scale on those calipers, now you're in a position to be able to really make hay. Um, so you bring in five, you look at the curvature reading, you get it as low as you can, like mid-20s on the field curvature, hopefully single digits on the tilt, but whatever the lowest, and then you go look at the image. And enlarge the image to 100%, look in each of the corners, and study the star shapes and see if they're good enough for you. Once they're good enough for you, then leave this for a while and get back to the hobby, because it's too frustrating to keep living your life by all this math for nights upon end. I, I was five nights doing this, four without the calipers and a fifth night with the calipers in which I felt like I was done in an hour enough to start observing again. And I haven't looked back yet. I'll get back to it eventually and work on it again. Um, so that's my journey with CCD Inspector. Now, if you've got a better way to use it, please comment in this video. And let's hope that your way of using it's better than mine. I, I I kind of explore this on my own. I'm, I'm on a journey. I'm not a guide. If you found a better way to use it, let us know. And, uh, and we'll all start following in your footsteps. But this worked for me. 
and it got rid of those horrible shapes that were in my corners and got them down to a level of acceptable, barely elongated stars now. So good luck. I hope this works for you, and I'll look forward to seeing your comments. If you like this kind of thing, please give this video a thumbs up. I'm not trying to monetize. I'm not trying to make any money off these, but it does help the channel to grow, and I hope it, then it'll help more people. So thanks a bunch for being a part of this hobby. And